All yeah. right. Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome hello. back to another amazing Geek Vibes Live interview. I'm your host, Tia, and I have the man behind pretty much everything on Small Engine Repair. His name is John Polono. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Tia. It's so nice to meet you. It's and very your puppy. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> uh, what's your, your puppy's name, by the way? That's uh, Jolene. Jo like the song? <laughs> yeah, my daughter named her because she has like green eyes. Oh, I love that. Well, my dog's name is Lady. So there you go, Jolene and Lady. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so you, I, I don't want to call Small Engine Repair a uh, one-man show, but it kind of is because you are the playwright, the director, the writer, the actor. I mean, what was it about this story that just made you <laughs> want to bring it to life, not only on the stage, but on the big screen? Um, that's a really good question. So... <laughs> I mean, there's some like poetic answers and then there's also the logistics. So the poetic answer is just, you know, in John Bernthal who was a, in the original cast. It started out as a more sort of edgy, provocative play that really was pushing buttons. And we got to see it like in real time, connect with an audience and just be one of those things that was battle tested and people just really clicked with it and connected with it. And the sort of deeper themes that it explored, people really appreciated seeing it in a sort of unfiltered way. So audiences were really clicking and, and having that feedback, which you only get in theater and seeing what people are laughing at, responding to, talking about it, adjusting, you know, taking into account and having the play done that I was involved with in LA for almost a year and then New York, off Broadway, and but the play's been done all over the country, all over the world at this point. And so it was really having material that just was connecting with people. And what I always liked about it was it, 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 the surprising quality of it, the unfiltered quality of it, and the fact that we really went out on a limb with the story, but that people were getting it. You know, it's uh, it's one of those pieces that's savage, but it's smart and it doesn't spoon feed things. And like, I was always, I'm always delightfully uh, impressed by when you create something that doesn't pander and that and really expects an audience to lean in and listen and be really smart and, and get it and that they do. So that was really the poetic answer. And then also, you know, when you're making an independent film, this material is primarily one location and that's very suitable for an independent film. You know, it's time is money. It costs a lot to move around and do that. And then, you know, playing the actor, uh, the character and just living in it. I was like, this is like a really once in a lifetime artistic opportunity right. to do. And, and, you know, to take time away from, you know, working on bigger studio movies and, and TV stuff and doing that. Um, I was like, I just going to go all in. And we just pushed all our chips in, uh, John and I, and then created this team around us. Yeah, you have um, your character, Frank, has this gruffness to him, which I will say that uh, when you came on, you're a lot more like pleasantly spoken than Frank no. is. Uh, and so how did you develop that <laughs> gruffness that uh, Frank has in the movie? I, look, I mean, I think for Frank, it was really, uh, I, I mean, I, ha I struggle with the temper. I mean, I, my dad had a really bad temper and, you know, I, I kind of, when my dad, look, my dad had a, a very abusive alcoholic father. And, and although my dad wasn't a big drinker, he had some rage issues and he had some of that. And growing up with that, I, you know, that feeling in, in, in being afraid of, but loving somebody at the same time, I, I sort of cherry picked a lot of that rage and that I, I have facets of that in myself. And I just sort of access that in the character. And then when it's tied into something righteous like the love of a daughter or protectiveness and all that stuff it's just there's nothing holding it back so it's really giving into that base impulse but look i grew up in the area you know i know the accent i just sort of created the composite of that character and and you know i think if i go back home and i hang out with my friends for a long time my accent comes back i get a couple of drinks i can sort of lean into that a little more you know i, I haven't lived in new england for 20 years but um you know, it's just part of who I am, but it's in, in, in knowing the character and, and just playing off of it. It's very sort of, I mean, the, one of the beauties of acting is, is you can be in someone else's skin and without judgment and go to those places and, and let loose in a safe way um, parts of your personality that might even scare you, but right. you're kind of working through. It's very cathartic. And Frank is a terrifying character to play and to be in, but 
I think it's always, you know, you got to find the humanity in him. And, and most of all, he loves, uh, oh, there's a cat too. I didn't see the cat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he uh, you know, he loves so deeply, but it's always that sort of not wanting to let that beast out of the cage. Yeah. When I was watching the movie, I mean, there were several times where I sat there and I was like, Frank, calm down. You don't want yeah. to, you know, do anything to jeopardize uh, being with your daughter. And then obviously I, I don't want to spoil anything, even though the movie's been out, I don't want to spoil anything for those who are uh, listening and watching. But I mean, when you finally find out why Frank is doing what he's doing, um, you understand. So I'm, um, kind of going back when you were and i hope you don't mind me bringing this up you were speaking about your father and uh there's that one scene in the movie where it's a flashback um and you see the three dads really engaged in uh a sports uh you know game and everything so i mean did did that you know was that inspired by you know did you feel inspiration by you know past events in that scene yeah, I mean, look, I think that the, you know, that that's a much more intense, like Scorsese version of that. But right. I do remember watching the Red Sox with a couple of friends and our dads were watching it upstairs and they would they would not get, a, the, you know, abusive like that. But it was like, let's just stay out of their way for a little bit because they're angry. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, certainly, you know, man, I think I came up with, in an era where our fathers were a lot more open about you know, beating your ass a little bit. And, you know, I think a lot of times in the movies, it's like taking the belt off and it's like, it's not that it's usually like a lashing out in in a moment like that, especially when drinking is involved. I mean, that's a much more cinematic amplified version of it, but for sure, I think that definitely the culture I came from, there was a lot more, you know, you'd be at your friend's house and his dad would come over and start beating his ass a little bit in a way that like, you can't, you don't do today, but certainly these guys came up with it. And, and I felt that that was uh, an honest portrayal. And I'm sure there's still a lot of people like that. You know? So you're from the New England area. I'm from New York. Does that oh, automatically nice. make us enemies right now? No, no I, think we're, I think we're friends. I was actually born in New York. My dad's oh. born and raised in Queens. Nice. And my mom and dad met in Manhattan. She's from Rhode Island. And then we moved. I was born on Long Island. And when I was like four, we moved out. So, but still have family and stuff there. I mean, I love New York. It's sort of like, you know, that's my grandparents came over on uh, Ellis Island from Italy. It's like we are, are, are sort of intertwined with New York City. And, and I'm, I, I love it. It's one of my favorite, you know, it might be my favorite city. I lived there for a while too. So no, definitely not. Enemy. <laughs> what part of New York are you from? Uh, I'm from Westchester. So a little bit above New York, but uh, my uh, ancestors also came to Ellis Island from Italy. So there you go. I mean, you you (laughs) Um, you know, before I hit record, I had asked you about the dog because I'm, as you can see, I'm a pet lover. So obviously I'm going to gravitate towards the animals in the movie. And I saw the dog in your film and you said that there was a really nice story. So I kind of wanted to uh, get that on air. So sort of the, the, those, that's John Bernthal's dog boss, the, and, that's and, boss, and, okay. and it's his dog, Bam Bam, who plays that dog in sort of the flashbacks, the younger version of that mm-hmm. dog. So boss is one of the most remarkable dogs I've ever met. He, John, when I first met him and we were rehearsing the play, he'd bring his pit bulls and they were just, they're so trained. They would just hang out there. But boss was just an exceptional dog. Like you just fell in love with him. He was so smart. He was like a person. He's like, I always said he was the Steve McQueen of dogs. Cause he's mm-hmm. like, so cool he'd hang out every night with us backstage he'd sit in the hallway and you'd come out when you're doing the play to like wait and you'd be off stage and he'd wag his tail and just kind of look at you and he was so chill and um you know we when the when the play moved to off broadway to new york i wanted john was supposed to be in the cast but then he ended up booking fury and i was like let's put boss on stage and everyone was into it so then when you know when we were gearing up for the film where I was like, he's got to be in there. I wrote him in the film. And, and so boss was uh, uh, diagnosed with uh, uh, stomach cancer. Mm -hmm. And it was like, we don't know, we don't know. And and he pulled it through. He passed away shortly after we wrapped the film. We actually dedicated the movie to him. If you watch the end credits, Um, because he, he hit all his marks. He was there. He just stuck it through. And I mean, like you, I've never met a dog like him. And I just, he's just incredible, incredible soul. And, you know, we all deeply fell in love with him. And, you know, I have always loved dogs, but I I never had a a pit bull until I met Boss. And subsequently I've had a few since then. They're now my favorite breed because he was such an ambassador of it. 
And uh, I just saw like what that dog, the soulfulness of that breed through him. I, and he, he just was remarkable. I think that um, anyone who's a John Bernthal fan kind of felt that that was boss uh, from yeah. us who kind of met John Bernthal through the Punisher. And we're like, I think that's <laughs> right. who that dog is. So that's a really I mean, that dog story. has been boss in his the dog Venice and now Bam Bam. They have cameos and a lot of stuff he does. But yeah. it's, to my knowledge, they, boss has never had such a central role. And I mean, that's the thing, you know, like he could barely lift. You have to lift him up and put him on the bed and Sierra cuddles with him and he's licking her and you know, and then, I mean, every moment you have with that dog, he's just, pre I mean, he's one of the best actors in the movie. There's no <laughs> I mean, you all were phenomenal actors in the film. So, I mean, uh, you said before you. that John was in the play version of Small and Repair, but how was it doing the movie version with both him and Shay? Uh, you know, just because the three of you just had this wonderful like relationship where you really felt like the three of you were friends in real life. Well, you know, John and I really are, he's one of my best friends. I've known him. I met him through the play 10 years ago and we just have worked on so much together and our families are intertwined and, you know, our fam both our families were in the movie in different roles. Uh, you know, Dottie is my wife. The babysitter is my daughter. The little boy sleeping with Dottie is my son and John's uh, daughter plays the girl in the flashback at the beginning his sons had a little cameo that was cut and joy. but so john and i were obviously pals and the chemistry of the three guys is so crucial the movie doesn't work without it and john knew shay but we, you know I, I met him early on and as happens with an independent film is you're working on it and you're just waiting for that runway to open up you know that you can shoot it when everyone's schedules kind of align and so we just were rehearsing for months the three of us sitting down at the table, going over the script and I rewrote it based on feedback and constantly going and really developed a, a, a deep friendship with, with Shay. As happens, I think when you get a little older and you've been doing it long enough and you, you meet people who have a similar aesthetic and they're just open to it. And, you know, making a movie or a play or stuff like that, it's kind of like when you do a sport and you just become bonded with your teammates, you all have a similar purpose. And, you know, Shay and I bonded really quick and he, he knew John. So by the time we were shooting, we were all dear friends and in support of a tricky movie that was very, very challenging to shoot. And thematically in the, in the material, we knew we were like, it's exhilarating to create something that sort of walks that line and, and is provocative. And we were just it, that that bonded us further, you know. And that's amazing to hear. Um from the play into the movie, I mean, what were the changes that um, you felt that you should implement to kind of, you know, because things on stage sure. don't always work on film and vice versa. Absolutely. I mean, the play is a one act play. The lights are up and it has it. And, and there's a there's a quicker banter to it. There's more sort of, you know, theater. You do the same performance and you, you, you a lot of the uh, the rhythm and the musicality of the punchlines. And in film, the humor is more thrown away. It's less. It's just different. The biggest change was the the, the play is all dudes. It's the three friends and then it's the chat. Right. And in the movie, obviously, you have the women. Right. And that was the biggest change. People, characters who were referred to now taking central mm -hmm. roles. Crystal's the heart. She's the heart of the play, but she's referred to. She's right. the heart of the movie and you meet her. And Karen and Dottie and, and you know, and Judy. Like every, in in Sueno's sisters, like the beauty, my favorite thing about the movie was just the incorporation of the female presence in the women and really thematically how that tracks and how the character is in the story are so you know, profoundly affected by the women. And it's really about men trying to kind of keep up with them, um, which was evident in the play thematically, but became much more visually uh, cinematic in, in the movie. Yeah. So that was, that was the biggest, most profound sort of change of that. And obviously it opens up and it shifts. I think, I think the movie is darker and deeper than the play in, in many ways. And, and uh, you know, just spending more time with the characters, it's more intimate. It's uh, it's scarier, I think, but uh but you know the core themes stay, but and and a lot of the humor is not is thrown away. Like I think you kind of have to see the movie more than once to really get most of the humor because it's just thrown away and you made in the moment, not realize what you missed. Well, one of my favorite humorous moments definitely came from seeing John Bernthal with the mask on and his sisters yeah. around everything. I mean that was great. Um, yeah. But I love the relationship between Frank and Crystal because. 
I will tell you right now, I would never speak to my dad like that. Um, but I thought it was great because that just goes to show how um, like amazingly close they were. Um, and Crystal, the character, is just so fantastic. Um, and, and you can tell like how much everyone really loves her. So it must have been really nice to be able to bring her into the movie, whereas you just said she's just referred to in the play. Well, and, and listen, I don't I don't think if we didn't get an actor as special as Sierra Bravo, I don't know if the movie would work as well as it does. And she, you know, we were working together for three weeks until she showed up and she just killed us. And and it was like, it was amazing. She's, I I mean, she's the real deal. And she has such, so prepared, has such attitude. And like, again, John and I have known for 10 years. So we're Mm -hmm. sitting at a table, busting balls, Shay, who's been part of it. We're all in it deep. And then Sierra shows up and she doesn't miss a, a second of it she just jumps right in for you know we have fortunate enough to shoot quite a bit of cool stuff with her and like most of it's on screen which doesn't always happen and you know every time she's there I just I mean I think she just lends such a heart and such attitude you know and you know that's that was it that was a choice you know having that Chris like Frank doesn't really have any grounds to stand on morally to tell her not to swear or do that I mean he's trying to not get her to smoke and do all that stuff but it's like He's doing the best he can. That's sort of the story that it's telling, you know, and and I think she kind of is really adept at code switching. Like she talks that way to them because it's like how she communicates with them. But that's not how she necessarily has to talk to other people. Right. Which is kind of fun. It's nice because Frank is, you know, a perfect dad in the sense that he's perfect to her and for her, even though he's not necessarily a perfect person. Um, Right. You know, the end of the film to me feels very open-ended um was there ever a consideration of uh continuing this story or do you kind of want to leave it as let the audience think where this goes yeah i i i mean i feel like thematically there it look i i like movies that end with questions not in a frustrating way. Like, I think there's definitely a resolution to certain events in the, mm-hmm. in the thing. But I do think that the ending challenges an audience and it asks a lot of questions. And to me, the whole ending is to really subvert expectations of movies thematically and otherwise. In particular, you know, we're very conditioned to seeing certain s- situations put upon women in film. Right. And rarely has that happened to men. And, uh, and, and without spoiling anything, that's really was a big motive of that to be shocking. And it's like really hard to shock mm-hmm. people nowadays, but to just turn it on its head. Yeah. And look, that was a big purpose of the play in, in, in the movie too, is to walk away and be like, Jesus, what do we see? Let's talk about that and maybe watch it again. But have that like, it, it's resolved within the world of the, of the characters. But in terms of you as the viewer, I feel like I tried to make the camera sort of, turn to the audience a little bit and keep that lasting feeling that is complicated and not black and white by any means. And, and there was, a, I was trying for that lingering effect of it. Yeah. So I, you know, I look, I think I, it's very clear to me in terms of how the ending, what will continue to happen, right. but I tried to leave enough breathing room there. So maybe, you know, you can have your own, uh, your own interpretation. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know if I dodged I, that question too much. But. You actually did a really good job in not spoiling anything, but also giving me the answer when, okay. you know, <laughs> I mean, I feel like it's very prevalent. The, you know, what happens, that big shock and everything. I mean, when I was in high school, we certainly had that to a degree, but I feel as mm-hmm. if unfortunately high schoolers now have to deal with that a lot more so that really hit the nail on the head but well and 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 also i think to to your point to explore it to me it is the sort of sexism behind that meaning how far you have to go in order for a a man to experience the same degree of humiliation that that girls are all the time right it's it's really to me part of the deeper theme of the movie yeah and i mean if you decide to keep writing more, I'm here for it. If you decide to leave it as is, I'm here for it as well. But um, you should, you know what, you should, you might have fun. I wrote up a, a play called Lost Girls, which is sort of the okay. companion piece to this. It's from a female perspective. It's the same neighborhood and it's similar themes. 
it's it's more uh, this one leans a little into thriller whereas that one leads a little bit more into uh sort of rom uh, of sort of a tragic romance but like it it's it's uh it's a slight continuation thematically of the of the story and is that out like uh in a book form or you know oh how yeah it's, a, it's published by uh drama display services you can buy it at online or like a theater store or whatever all right. So those who are watching and listening, make sure you check that out. Um, you know, John, I don't want to take up too much of your time this afternoon, but no I definitely want to know, I mean, what else are you working on? What else would you like to promote for our viewers? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, you know, listen, I've worked, I have a lot of uh, screenplays uh, that are uh, in various stages of development. I think, you know, with COVID sort of pumping the brakes on some things and I'm about to start some really cool stuff. I think probably the most high profile thing I'm working on right now is Hulk Hogan biopic with uh, uh, Scott Silver, co-writer for Todd nice. Phillips that I'm super excited about. That's like a really big sort of high profile thing. And most of the other stuff as uh, you know, I, I'm surprised once you start working in it is like, you can't really talk about it until it's like announced. So like some of the coolest shit I've done, it's just like, I can't talk about it yet, but hopefully soon. So you'll have to have me back when that stuff breaks. Listen, I'd be more than happy to have you back. And yes, I've gotten a lot of actors, right? They're like, I have things, but I can't talk about it. And I'm like, no, I know. Right, it's well, just next so time. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, though. But uh, John, thank you so much again for taking the time to speak with me. Absolutely. Everyone, please make sure that you check out Small Engine Repair. You will not be disappointed. And again, hopefully I get to get you on for future projects that you have. Sounds great. All right. All have right. a good day. Thank you.